Good evening and welcome to another edition of Tiger's Roar. I'm Tommy Chrysan of Pelican Sports TV, joined by Chris Landry, NFL scout and Fox Sports football analyst. Chris, how you doing tonight? Uh, Tommy, I'm doing well. Always a pleasure to be with you. Chris, 10 football games in the books and for the first time since 1958, LSU is 10-0. That's something to toot your horn about. Absolutely. Of course, Les Miles get it, uh, gets his 100th victory, so congratulations to him. It's been quite a run this year. and. Uh, it's going to be quite a, a stretch run as, uh, as we get into the really, you know, the, the last uh, couple of games here, but uh, potentially even more. It's, uh, it's uh, been an exciting season for LSU fans, and uh, uh, we uh, can't wait to kind of break down uh, last week and get well, into the Well, and we'll get into a lot of stuff on this two-hour program, but the fact of the matter is only LSU and Oklahoma State can completely control their own destiny for a berth down in New Orleans. We've got folks watching us in New Orleans on Pelican Sports TV, Baton Rouge Lafayette, New Orleans. Monday night, January 9th, Oklahoma State beats Iowa State and beats Oklahoma on December 3rd. That game's in Stillwater. If LSU beats Ole Miss, Arkansas, and their opponent in the SEC championship game on December 3rd, probably Georgia, those two teams will meet in January 9th, and it will not matter what anyone else does. It's a good position for those two teams. Yeah, it is, and, and, and of course you're right, because as the, the process, the BCS process, two-thirds of it, human voters, and a third being computer, um, there's really no way that a one-loss team is going to overtake an unbeaten Oklahoma State team for the number two spot. You look at the difference there, even if they're just able to win those games, uh, maybe not by an impressive margin, and they have been winning by an impressive yeah. margin, but if they don't, It'll be enough, and uh, I vote in the Harris Poll, and one of the things that, that I get asked, that, well, how do you decide? Well, to me, it's the two most deserving teams, and with that, it also is who's the two best teams, but if you ask me on film who's the two best teams in the country, it's LSU and Alabama, but Oklahoma State's more deserving because they have run through top to bottom a better conference. The Big 12, certainly from the middle to the bottom, is tougher than the SEC this year, and they've done their job. So you're right. If they went out, they will be in the championship game. Certainly LSU would. Uh, but boy, when you think about the game against Oklahoma, even without Ryan Broyles, Dominic Whaley, their fine back and fine receiver, and particularly Broyles, who's caught more passes than anybody in college football history, uh, Oklahoma still got a good chance to win that game. LSU still got a, potentially a couple of tough games. We could, uh, we could see real chaos in the BCS, and we'll go through some scenarios later about what would happen if, because we do know, as you said, if they run the table, we know what the championship game will look like. We remind you, Tigers Roar is live on Wednesday nights, two full hours. Spread the roar for us on Pelican Sports TV, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, New Orleans. We do stream on the Internet, as you see in the gold belt on your screen, PelicanSportsTV.com. We got a lot of stuff for you tonight. We're going to review, recap the victory over Western Kentucky. Going to get you ready for the matchup with Ole Miss this Saturday night in Oxford, 6 o'clock kickoff. Uh, we'll also take our weekly run through the LSU Athletic Department. we got some other sports, including men's and women's basketball that are underway. In fact, women's basketball playing as we speak to you right now on a Wednesday night, and we will have a final score for you when that game uh, does become final. We'll have our Louisiana Sports Rise Association uh, weekly award winners of college football in the state of Louisiana. Uh, won't hear from Brian Lazar of TigerBait.com tonight. He's covering that women's basketball game, but we will hear from Ronnie Rance of Sports Shorts TV and Sports Shorts Radio. He's got some interesting comments about the baseball team for you. Yeah, fall baseball's over, but we got Ronnie's got some good stuff for you. And tonight, near the end of the program, we're going to take some time to kind of play the what-if game a little bit in the BCS. Uh, we'll let you know about the Harris Poll. Even got some Heisman Trophy talk that we'll uh, crank up. Hey, that thing's not that far down the road. With this being, you know, we're just a bit past the midpoint in November. That trophy is given away, I want to say, in less than a month from now that it will be awarded. Is it awarded on the 3rd or the 10th? No, it's, it's like the 10th. 10th, the, okay. The, the 10th would be a Saturday. That's when the LHSAA has their state prep championships down in the Superdome. And now that I'm thinking about it, it's always, it always comes out that same Saturday that the LHSAA has their championships in the Dome because there's been times when I've been in the Dome for them games and you always catch that announcement. So we got all of that kind of stuff for you and more. We remind you, this is Pelican Sports TV, Baton Rouge Lafayette and the Walls, but we got Pelican Sports Radio and we got the Chris Landry Show for you. It's each and every Thursday, 2 o'clock until 3 o'clock on The Score 1210 AM in Baton Rouge. Streams on the internet at thescore1210.com. The Chris Landry Show from 2 until 3 p.m. Again, it uh, streams on the internet. 
It is available via podcast later that night. Chris, give everybody a hint of what you're going to have for them on this week's edition of the Chris Landry Show. Well, as we always do during the regular season, we'll go over some of the key matchups in college football and the NFL. Not nearly the big matchups that we've seen the past couple of weeks in college, but still a lot to be determined uh, in, a, in different conferences. So we'll go over some key college matchups. It's not as many uh, big NFL matchups, but we're getting towards Thanksgiving, so those games become really important. We'll get into some of those, like Cincinnati and Baltimore. All the latest news around college football and the NFL. Some latest news on Penn State. Their possibility, it looks like, that they will not go to a bowl game. Obviously, they're eligible for a bowl game, but they're looking at it from a PR standpoint, considering administratively not to go. All the latest coaching search stuff. We'll talk a little bit about Ole Miss tonight. But give an update on the Tulane Ole Miss situation. New Mexico's hired Bob Davey, the former Notre Dame coach. Go over and get the latest on the Arizona situation. So all that, lots more. Uh, a lot, uh, usually a jam-packed uh, hour of football. Yeah, there you go. And following the Chris Landry Show, uh, Pelican Sports Radio, which airs Monday through Friday from 3 until 4 p.m. That same station, the score 12, 10 a.m., and online at the score 12, com. Take your phone calls on that show. We got different guests on different days of the week. We got some remote sponsor locations. You can come out and join us. Pelican Sports Radio, Monday through Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, on the score 12, 10 a.m. in Baton Rouge. And don't forget, immediately following the LSU Ole Miss game, it's the WJBO Pelican Sports TV phone's first post-game show. That's right, WJBO, 11.50 a.m. on your radio dial in Baton Rouge, WJBO.com. And Pelican Sports TV, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, New Orleans, the phone's first post-game show. It's hosted by myself, Tommy Chrysan, and Richard Condon, radio icon in the Baton Rouge market. Phones first, WJBO Pelican Sports TV post game show, immediately following LSU and Ole Miss about 9.15, give or take a few minutes. As soon as that game clock says 0, 0, 0, give us four, five, six minutes, we'll be on the air taking your phone calls and talking about LSU and Ole Miss. Great way to keep up with all the activities of Pelican Sports TV and Pelican Sports Radio and the Chris Landry Show. It is on Facebook. Our Facebook page is Pelican Broadcasting. Uh, we got a Twitter account, at Pelican Sports, a YouTube page, which features many of the things we do here on Tigers Roar and some of the high school stuff we do and a few other things here at Pelican Broadcasting. So YouTube, Facebook, it's all there. We got the social media world going on with you. And uh, we always appreciate your emails. We, got, we get emails every day about radio, TV, questions, comments. Uh, information. The email address is pelicanbroadcasting at gmail.com. We will get it to the correct people uh, when you send that email in. And again, we appreciate everybody tuning in. We remind you, Tigers Roar is live on a Wednesday night. It repeats in New Orleans, North Shore, Bayou Country, and Mississippi Gulf Coast on WHNO TV Channel 20 from 5 to 7 p.m. on a Friday. Got some other outlets that pick it up, including Pelican replaying it on Thursdays and Saturdays. So if you got us on a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, you got a rebroadcast going, but we appreciate your time and you being tuned in. When we come back, Chris Landry and me, Tommy Chrysan, will recap Western Kentucky. LSU beat them 42-9 to on homecoming night in Tiger Stadium last week. We'll talk about that game, get some comments from Coach Miles and the players. Spread the roar. Stay with us. Pelican Sports TV, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, and New Orleans, Tigers Roar. I am Glenn Big Baby Davis, and you're watching Pelican Sports Television. Hi, I'm attorney Kerry Bryson. My law firm focuses specifically on helping people try to solve their IRS tax problems. Lately, so many new out-of-state companies are popping up claiming that if you send them money, they can resolve your IRS problems. But what happens if they don't? Do you hire an attorney? Maybe you should start with a local attorney that's already handled hundreds of IRS cases right here in Louisiana. When you hire the Bryson Law Firm, you won't be speaking long distance or sending money to some out-of-town high-pressure salesman. You'll meet with us in person at our office right here in Baton Rouge. Your first visit is completely free and confidential, and we'll tell you on the spot exactly how much it'll cost. So if you're hiring a company to resolve your IRS wage levies, bank levies, or tax liens, check their reputation first, then call me, Kerry Bryson, or go to brysonlawfirm.com. If you're a Louisiana resident and you have an IRS problem, hire a Louisiana attorney, Kerry Bryson. Hello, my name is Debbie. Welcome to Debbie's Bridal, a formal affair. Come see the many great lines we carry in bridal, bridesmaids, 
mothers, flower girls, tuxes, and more. We also carry over 25 top designer lines in debutante gowns, Mardi Gras, pageant, and prom. Come meet me and my staff with over 30 years of bridal and pageant experience. Debbie's Bridal, a formal affair, Burnside and Gonzalez, where service matters. The family dental practice of Dr. Farrell Frugge Jr. and our highly trained staff are dedicated to providing care and treatment to our patients of all ages in all aspects of dental care. 23 years of experience and advanced training in cosmetic and restorative dentistry, TMJ and treatment of snoring and sleep apnea allows Dr. Frugge to assist you in achieving the best in dental health. Call us today at 292-9700 to schedule your initial evaluation because we know how to make you smile. We continue with Tiger's Roar. Glad to have you tune in and we appreciate it. Uh, Chris, LSU beat Western Kentucky 42-9 in Tiger Stadium. Only had a 14-7 lead at halftime. Outscored West Kentucky 28 to 2 in the second half. Uh, probably guilty of a little bit of sleepwalking after the emotional and physical game against Alabama. Alabama, likewise, a little bit of a slow start in Starkville. They did miss a couple more field goals, by the way. But, you know, I, I think no one could be totally surprised that LSU started just a, a hair slow uh, against Western Kentucky. A little bit anticipated, no question. It was, uh, quite frankly, not a very good first half performance. Uh, you know, offensively, they saw a heavy blitz package, which is why they went with Jordan Jefferson uh, for as long as they did. Uh, I think they, they like him a little bit better against a blitz pressure look. And defensively, a lot of misaligns, a lot of missed tackles, uh, the spread, uh, attack kind of confused uh, LSU a little bit, took them a little time to adjust. So you're right, it was a very slow, uh, sloppy performance, and with Western Kentucky was made, able to make a couple of big plays. You see the fine tight end there we talked about last week, caught five passes in the first half, and none in the second half. So you saw LSU settle down, uh, really start to insert their physical uh, will against them. You see the, the mistake here, the turnover, uh, all signs of, you know, not much intensity in that first half effort. Chris, I got a uh, text message, I want to say it was, or an email uh, late in the second quarter of this game, and I, I might hit one of your little nerves here, but somebody texted me and said, Western Kentucky's wearing red and white. Didn't Miami of Ohio have red and white <laughs> on uh, sure back did. in 86? And I went, yes, they did. Sure of course, did. you were part of the LSU staff yeah. at that time. And I said, yeah, Miami of Ohio was red and white. They were like, oh, my, I hope that doesn't happen again. I said, I think they'll separate themselves, which they did do. Well, that's right. And if you remember back then, the LSU was wearing purple at home all the time because they had to before we were able to get the uniform changes back again. But, yeah, Nisha certainly had a protection breakdown here on, uh, on the safety there. But uh, LSU certainly was able to kind of change things around in the second half, did a really good job. Uh, I thought they made some good adjustments uh, uh, in the second half and, and just play with a lot uh, – a lot more physicality. I thought that was uh, the real difference. If, if you look at it, they were very aggressive in the first half was LSU. They threw the football on six of ten first downs. Uh, if you go and ran two tight end sets uh, uh, quite a bit uh, in the second half, and they were able to, to, to physically kind of impose their will uh, uh, against this Western Kentucky team. That, that, quite frankly, played hard, played well for half. And here now are going to be some comments from Coach Les Miles and the players. As usual, the uh, Pelican Sports TV staff out on campus Monday for, for the weekly press luncheon and player interviews. And I will have some of this stuff for you throughout. And I will also hear from Coach Houston Nutt a little bit later on in the program as well, the head coach of the Ole Miss Rebels, I should say, lame duck head coach, as he will be uh, gone uh, after they play Mississippi State in a couple of weeks. Here now are those comments about the uh, Western Kentucky game uh, from Coach Miles and some of the players. Always a pleasure to uh, uh, to be in Tiger Stadium at night. Uh, enjoy a uh, a homecoming crowd. Um, I, I, I can just tell you that uh, our football team. We walk down that hill. We take part in what are the traditions of our school. Um, it's just it's just a tremendous uh, feeling. I tell you that our guys enjoy it greatly. Um, I didn't think that this was a, uh, a game where we played with a real emotion or a, a passion. I felt like we, we did the things that we needed to do to ensure victory. Uh, I think we started slow, uh, certainly, and, uh, as a team. And 
Um, but uh, again, I felt like uh, we did the things we needed to do. I just feel like, you know, everybody was really, really loose. Like, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we, we're in our books, you know, we, we looking at plays and stuff like that. But this time we were really loose. We were, you know, kind of joking around a little bit, you know, trying to kind of taking this team lightly. And uh, they came out and showed us, you know, why we shouldn't do it. And I feel like this uh, this time we ain't gonna let it, you know, let it happen again. Even though you know Ole Miss is on a down year this year, we just gotta come out, you know, uh, get on them and uh, stay on. You know, we know we prepare well for those guys, you know, and uh, you know, uh, definitely a, a big up to Western Kentucky. You know, they definitely came out to play those physical, you know, the uh, first half of the game. And uh, so it's really about us just settling it down and just. Uh, just trying to throw the punch at them come the uh, second half. Well, we uh, we saw how we started. We felt like we we needed a uh, you know we got uh, we got pressure right away. And I uh, I like uh, Jordan Jefferson's um, uh, uh, ability to move his feet. And so uh, we decided to stay with with him initially uh, in that uh, in that regard. And then and, but frankly, we'd like to have gotten uh, Lee back into the game maybe a little earlier in the second half. You know, had we started a little faster, I think Menberger would have played a lot of snaps. Um, and, you know, frankly, we felt like uh, we should have gotten more snaps to Lee. So that, uh, you know, there's a, uh, a, a need there. Uh, special teams didn't have a lot of chances to punt the ball. But, uh, um, you know, I think we were uh, not as uh, sharp on special teams. And certainly uh, our kickoff coverage was not what we wanted it to be. Made some mistakes. Uh, uh, just. Uh, uh, not uh, attention to detail there. Uh, really, I think we just came out a little less, lack of days ago, and I uh, really run uh, prepared for something like that. But I think we did a great job in the second half coming out, you know, doing the things that we need to do to come out with a victory. We came out in the second half, and in the second half, the, the atmosphere was really good too. You know, no one was down, even though we didn't have a great half, um, and we just came out and played LSU football after that. I think we, we probably uh, took a little bit off, you know, but, you know, we can't do that with Ole Miss. In, in the past years, Ole Miss gave us uh, gave a good fight, you know, and they brought us down to the fourth quarter a couple of times. So we know we got to go in there with it on our minds because they're going to come with it. They got the home field advantage and thing. So you, we know we got to play hard. Chris, as we take a look at the uh, game stats, so you, you stack comparison between two teams, uh, I can point out how sometimes. Uh, some stats are not real important. And you go to the bottom line on your screen, time of possession, Western Kentucky, more than 10 minutes, uh, 10 minutes, 50 seconds more time of possession, yet they're on the bottom end of a 33-point margin in the game. Uh, you can see the rest of the stats, the total yards, everything else is dominated by LSU. But once again, now when you look at that stat sheet, many times you couldn't call out a correct score if you didn't know the score. Well, you know, and, and really, if you break down this game in the first half, LSU, as I mentioned, uh, they passed the ball six out of ten times on first downs. They, they passed the football against a very blitz-heavy defense, and they didn't have a lot of success, and, and quite frankly, that, that contributed to not many snaps and, and not many much time of possession. So that's what really was the difference. I, there's no question that the game plan, I could see it as it was unfolding, that the game plan was to work on the passing game with Jordan Jefferson against the Blitz early. They didn't have a lot of success and then obviously had to go to, to the running game and work that and wear down this Western Kentucky team. Uh, I mean, certainly had they played it differently, uh, they, they, they could have run the football early against the Blitz and had some success. But I, I think they recognize that as an offense, they need to be more balanced, particularly with the passing game with Jordan Jefferson against blitz pressure in, in coming games. Arkansas, Georgia, if it, if it plays out that way, Georgia beats Kentucky, they're in. And then potentially a national championship game or bowl game, we'll just call it that. Those games where I think that they feel like they're going to need some plays, more effectiveness out of the passing game. And I do believe they feel more comfortable with Jordan Jefferson. Um, and that's why they're trying to, they're trying to work through that a little bit and give Jordan Jefferson the reps. Uh, but I think we've known to this point that they've had pretty good balance and some success with, uh, a lot of success with Jarrett Lee, but against blitz pressure, he hasn't been as effective. So that's what they're working through, I think, right uh, now. This week, the LSU Sports Information Department released a uh, press release about uh, punter Brad Wing. Uh, Brad Wing, the punter for 
uh, LSU, who has had a fabulous season and certainly would have to be a candidate for uh, the FCC uh, punter of the year or all-conference team, certainly the freshman all-conference team. But Brad Wing is a Ray Guy Awards semifinalist, uh, played his one-year high school football at Parkview Baptist right here in Baton Rouge. You see he's a semifinalist for the Ray Guy Award. Uh, 42.9 average, the long of 73, that came in the Alabama game. Uh, left-footed punter, can foot the, punt the football with either foot, but uh, primarily left and will use left, uh, I'm going to assume, at all times uh, for LSU. But Brad Wing has certainly been a key weapon, if you will, key component to the success of LSU this year on more than one occasion. Well, and, and I vote for that award. We, it's getting that time of getting all of my list, and Mo, we'll talk about Mo Claiborne's up for some awards as well. But, you know, Brad certainly, I've got him down ranked number one uh, in, in the as punter in the country. I haven't seen anybody more consistent. So uh, we'll see how he finishes up. There are a few other guys that have had good years, but uh, he's in good position, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wish him well. and. Uh, and uh, I, certainly he's uh, number one on my ballot if I had to hand it in now. And, of course, uh, he's the only punter in America to have scored a touchdown and had a call back. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Anyway, uh, it, it, as LSU has had to do on more than one occasion this year, be it against Northwestern State, be it Western Kentucky or some banged-up Tennessee and Auburn teams, you got to keep focused. The, the eye has got to be on the prize. It's got to be on the big picture. Here's some comments from Coach Les Miles and the players about this LSU team keeping their focus. The piece is, is uh, how you play football and, uh, uh, and, and how you want to be remembered and who you are. It's much more personal. And uh, to me, um, it, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, piece because um, without the the view of you know that bowl game, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult uh, piece to motivate. I, I find myself looking forward to it, but we we just take it one game at a time. You know, you can't can't go looking at the future already. You know, we got four games left, but we just got to take it one game at a time. I, th I think I think any player you know think about it. You know, the same as we thought about it. You know, week one and you know throughout the summer, but. You know, reality is, you know, we have two more games to play, and uh, you know, those games are critical. You know, moving forward into the uh, into the championship game and the uh, national championship game. What has to happen for a team that wins a championship is they have to handle these opponents in a similar fashion and treat them with their best effort. Understand how we play offense, defense, and special teams. That it, it doesn't look any different just because of the opponent that we play, and that uh, that we you know, come to play um, like we play in every game. If we look past any team, especially now so late in the season, you know, that, that national title won't come. So it's sort of hard to look past the, the great teams we're about to play, the Ole Miss, the Arkansas, and stuff like that. And, um, you know, it, yeah, we, we watch uh, Oklahoma State and we see them putting up, you know, massive amount of points. Um, and, you know, if it did come down to us and them, then, you know, we, we'd love to play against them. That would be a great opportunity for our football team, I think. You know, it's so close. You you know, you reach out and grab it, but you just you still got to focus uh, on you know the week by week. You know, we still got a uh, you know Ole Miss, and we still got a one one loss to Arkansas. You know, the week after that uh, in Tiger Stadium. So we just got to come out uh, uh, week by week. You know, uh, once we if we get to the uh, SEC championship and we win that, then we can start focusing on the national championship. So I feel like that's what we have to do now. I think that that's their. I think they understand that it's all about the finish. And you know to put themselves in position, you know where they're at right now, and you know, you know to continue uh, is is the issue. I uh, I'm not surprised that uh, that this team wants to be championship team. I'm not surprised how they practice. I'm not surprised how they you know look at it in a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I uh, you know it, it's uh, the, the the good news is is we're in that position you know, based on that, and now it's an opportunity to finish. When we come back, 
We'll talk about the LSU Ole Miss game. A lot of trouble brewing, a lot of issues brewing up in Oxford, Mississippi, and we'll get into all of that and more. That is LSU's opponent uh, this Saturday night. It's ESPN, 6 o'clock. We'll have the post-game show at about 9.15, 9.30 with Richard Conner and me, Tommy Chrysan. We'll come back, preview the LSU Ole Miss matchup for you with Chris Landry, NFL scout and Fox Sports football analyst. I am Tommy Chrysan. Spread the roar. You're watching Tigers Roar on Pelican Sports TV, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, and New Orleans, and online at pelicansportstv.com. Hi, I'm Joe Horn, and you're watching Pelican Sports TV. BetterBatonRougeJobs.com has been extremely beneficial for the team automotive group. And what stands out to us, it's easy to use, not only for us, but it's easy for the applicants. And it's the quality of applicants that we get. It's timely. We post something in the morning. By that afternoon, we have double-digit applicants. And again, it's the quality of the applicants. Employers, now is a great time to hire, recruit, and look for potential new employees. BetterBatonRougeJobs.com. It's free for job seekers and great for business. You're on the same plane. We'll be on the same plane. Yeah, what was your work? Anything together? Do we know that? <laughs> Got it. Thanks, Dave. The big, brilliant, thin Samsung Infuse 4G. Only from the network of possibilities. AT&T. For the thirsty, for those who hang out in packs, for heroes, for sidekicks, for those who see the glass half empty, for those who see it half full, for those on the right, for those on the left, for those with nicknames, for those with curves, for people that cycle, for people that recycle, for BFFs, for frenemies, for those with style, for lovers, for families, for big families, for everyone. Pelican Sports TV presents Pelican Radio. Get ready to mix it up with me, Tommy Chrysan, and Chris Landry weekday afternoons from 3 to 4 p.m. Pro sports, college sports, high school sports, and much more on The Score 1210 AM and on the internet at thescore1210.com. 40 years, four decades, nearly half a century. That's how long the citizens of Greater Baton Rouge have chosen Richard's Honda. A simple, sincere, and honest process. Louisiana's oldest and most experienced Honda dealership for over 40 years, Richard's Honda. We continue with Tigers Roar. The Ole Miss Rebels are the LSU opponent this week, and trust me, if you don't know this, you need to know this, Ole Miss has a very rich football tradition that goes back a long way. Uh, you go back to the, to the days when Jake Gibbs and the Rebels and the Billy Cat and Punt returned. Coach Johnny Vaught, a legendary coach at, at Ole Miss, his name on the stadium. You, I can go back to the to Archie Manning playing with the broken arm uh, in Tiger Stadium and a LSU walloping them pretty good. I can uh, the Brad Day, Britt Davis touchdown catch from Burt Jones on the clock and you know some other LSU Ole Miss battles that, that were epic over the years. But Chris, this is an Ole Miss team that is flat out not very good. You mentioned to me uh, a little bit earlier that the um, this is the highest points per game average that Ole Miss has given up in school history. They've got a lame duck coach. It's already been announced that Coach Houston Nutt, who's in his fourth year, will be out after the season. Uh, the AD will step down sometime, Pete Boone, next year, sometime during the course of the year 2012. He's not even involved in the current coaching search, which is being spearheaded by former Ole Miss Rebel in New Orleans Saint Archie Manning. And uh, it's a mess in Oxford, to say the least. And on top of that, Chris, they've suspended a handful of players for this game, including their starting quarterback, Randall Mackey, who played his high school ball in Bastrop, Louisiana, up in the northeast corner of the state. He was down in uh, Port Sulphur before Katrina and then relocated to Bastrop. Uh, so he is a Louisiana guy. Uh, their best running back, Jeff Scott, also suspended their leading ground gainer. Uh, so that just put a little bit more uh, cloud over an already very cloudy situation with Ole Miss football. And Corvick Neat, their H-back, is a fine player, along with, uh, with Scott. He and Neat uh, provide the best, the one positive that Ole Miss has, the best punt return unit in the country. Their two, those two punt returners are going to be suspended for the game. Ole Miss has lost 12 consecutive SEC games. 
They got beat, and I mean beat and handled, taken behind the woodshed by Louisiana Tech by 20 points. Um, their offense in Oxford, is, yeah. The offense has sputtered all year long. It's been atrocious. Uh, the offensive line in particular has struggled to control the line of scrimmage. Pass protection has uh, really been a problem, which is doubly more of an issue this week because Zach Stout, Cliff Stout's son, uh, former Steeler, um, is a drop back guy, not very mobile. At least Mackey could move around a little bit, but there's no question uh, Louisiana Tech ran right at this defense. So at the line of scrimmage, both sides are not very good. And uh, while Houston Nutt has had success against LSU in the past, it's been with teams that have a little bit more firepower than this has. And, and there's no question that uh, uh, y there's some debate about where the direction of the program is going and how good the recruiting classes the last couple of years are. but. You look at Houston, he took over a team with some pretty good talent. Uh, Ed Orgeron, good recruiter, not a very good coach. That team grossly underachieved. Houston, that brought it to uh, two Cotton Bowls. And, but the talent level has dropped considerably. Uh, and we'll see into the future, from a talent standpoint, some of these recruiting classes may pan out. But uh, there, there's no question uh, this is not a very good team. They're like 109th in scoring offense, the 113th in total offense, and 104th in pass offense. And you just mentioned the defense is uh, as bad as they've ever been giving up points. So other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? But uh, <laughs> it's, it's been really a tough season. Uh, I, it's tough to look at watching them. To determine which one's worse between Ole Miss and Kentucky on film is pretty hard to discern. Uh, because both are, are pretty inept at times. They'd probably give a slight edge to Ole Miss being worse. But they'll play hard. They'll, they'll play well. Uh, last senior game night, for them, last senior home night. game. Um, but, you know, how much can they sustain with that? It really is one of those games, I like to put it this way, simply put. Can Ole Miss beat LSU? No, it cannot. Can LSU lose the game? Well, that's always possible. If you play poorly enough, you have enough negative plays to allow an inferior team a chance to win it. That's certainly possible. I don't anticipate it to be. I expect LSU to play with greater intensity. They see the finish line now. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how it plays out. But, and I do expect Ole Miss to, to, play, uh, to play hard and uh, you know, certainly try to give it uh, a last go in their, their last senior night. It's senior night. It's their last home game. They're going to have a little enthusiasm for that, you would think. That might last a series or two. And then after that, I think we'll, we'll see the separation. Between Ole, Miss the has, Ole Miss has played a number one ranked team in their history eight times and they've never beaten the number one ranked well, team. And I don't think it'll happen this Saturday. And they've had better opportunities to beat a number one. They've had teams that have been more capable of beating a number one team. Some of them were Alabama teams. But by the way, Ole Miss, you mentioned some history. Uh, Ole Miss 1969. Ole Miss Archie Manning against Alabama. The first college football night game televised. Uh, that was big ABC back in the day. But uh, and of course, that was a way days gone by. Long Everybody time. remembers that night uh, Herb Tyler and LSU took down Florida in Tiger Stadium when Florida was number one. Ole Miss beat LSU the next week. That's correct. No question about it. Here, Tommy Tuberville. Here are some comments from Coach Miles and the players about Ole Miss this weekend and the rivalry. Ole Miss um, is, a, uh, is a team that's uh, very dangerous. And the fact that they will see us as a great rivalry uh, that will be a, an opportunity for them to play best at home. And uh, we must be prepared for their best shot. Uh, certainly, we will prepare that way. Um, I, uh, I recognize that uh, Houston Nuts, their coach, and they've won a lot of games under him, and he's won a lot of games in his career. I'm certain that they'll be prepared. I know they'll do the right things. So, uh, again, we're... Uh, you know, looking forward to playing um, a uh, very quality Ole Miss team playing at their best. They're, uh, we got to go into practice, stay focused, get fundamentally sound, work on the stuff we had mistakes in in the game Saturday, and just come out and ready to play. Uh, well, right now I'm really focused on Ole Miss, and I can't really look forward down the road. You know, I know Ole Miss is going to give us the best shot, so we got to leave Arkansas where they're at right now. I, I like going to other field, you know, just to beat another team in their home, on their home field, it, it feels great, you know. To know you can go in their house and, and beat them and just walk all over, you know, it just makes you feel much better to uh, be a number one team. Um, the Arkansas doesn't mean anything if, if we lose this one. So um, Coach always says the next game is the most important one, and that's this week. So 
you know, Ole Miss, we're going to get their best shot. They're going to throw everything at us, um, so, and, and like every other team does. So we just got to prepare for them. And um, the, the Arkansas game doesn't mean anything if we lose this one. So, um, I feel like we just got to we just got to come with it on our mind this time. We can't come out flat like we did last time because this team is an SEC team. They can come out, you know, do what they have to do to come out with a victory. Um, uh, I feel like, uh, you know, last week, you know, we didn't we didn't do too well with that. So, and this is a whole different opponent in, a, you know, in our division. So we have to, you know, really do what we have to do to uh, come out with a victory in their stadium. Chris, as we mentioned, Ole Miss uh, at, at this time and for two more games, is coached by Houston Nutt. And uh, <clears throat> something I looked up just before the show tonight, First off, a uh, fact is uh, that Houston Nutt is 6-7 and seven against LSU as a head coach. And I looked it up very quickly, and if I'm wrong, I'll have to be corrected. But since 2000, which was Nick Saban's first year as coach at LSU, since t and Houston Nutt was at Arkansas at the time, since 2000, he's got six victories against LSU on the football field, be it Arkansas or Ole Miss. I don't think there's another coach since 6,000 that has six wins against um, LSU. You see the graphic on your screen. Fourth year at Ole Miss. Uh, was at Arkansas. One year at Boise State, uh, up at Murray State in Kentucky mm -hmm. for a little bit. But as you said a few minutes ago, Chris, he just doesn't have the thoroughbreds to run the race to maybe get his seventh victory against LSU. Well, you can you can go in uh, the national LSU's national last national championship team. You know, got beat by not only Kentucky, which is amazing that you could lose two games to begin with, and, and one uh, of them beat Kentucky and still be in the championship game. But uh, of course, Arkansas, they lost Arkansas both with Arkansas and Kentucky in overtime. But Houston Nutt, of course, you had Felix Jones, Darren McFadden, you had some weapons there. And, and if you look at, uh, is again, he's had a couple of good teams. Two years ago, we know what happened. Uh, the debacle in Oxford uh, and the time management situation. Uh, but Ole Miss had enough talent there to be able to keep that game close to be able to have a chance to win it in the end. They usually, when they play these games close, they usually have a, a you know, great deal of effectiveness. But no, the, and I think it's, it, it is a combination of the fact that Houston happens to have been in the West where he's coached at Arkansas and at Ole Miss and had some chances, um, had some good teams at Arkansas, and then he inherited some pretty good talent at Ole Miss. So, yeah, he's done a good job. And much like Tommy Tuberville, another former Ole Miss coach, Houston's always been good at getting his teams ready to play, particularly in an underdog role. He's very good at that. Some coaches are very good at that. Tuberville's very good at that. Tuberville did that this year at Texas Tech uh, at, uh, in Norman, Oklahoma. And they've lost three games since. In fact, they haven't even been in three, the last three games. But uh, that's been kind of Houston's mantra. If, if he can get his team in an underdog role, well, that's what he likes. That's what he's good. He's, he's, he's got an underdog role like he's never been before. I, I just don't think he has the weaponry to be able to make it happen. This we year. mentioned the rich tradition between LSU and Ole Miss. This will be the 100th meeting between these two schools, LSU and Ole Miss. Uh, LSU leads the series 56-39. There have been four ties. And a little interesting stat there, in, in the last 14, that, 14 games, games, LSU leads the series 8-6. Now, uh, I think it'll be 9-6 after Saturday, that's but that's a, only that's a, a forecast. That's a pretty even stat for programs that are not, has not been over that, that time span at the same level. Uh, now, you know, again, uh, Houston's first couple of years going to the Cotton Bowl, some good teams there, no question about it. But, no, that's a, that, uh, that says a lot, you know, that they – this is uh, their biggest rival. And you can talk about the Egg Bowl, Mississippi State, but uh, you have a lot of players uh, from Louisiana. But that uh, the old guard always looks at, you know, the LSU game is the, the Ole Miss old guard, that is, is the, it, the LSU game is their biggest game. So. Well, and certainly the matchups back in the 50s, 60s, oh, the, 70s those were, 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 were unreal. Were, you know, if we would have had internet back then and 92 TV stations covering games, those games would have been on every week, uh, every year that they played. Now, um, the, you know, the, the Ole Miss Rebels, it is what it is. You know, we say it's the 100th meeting, and that's true. But there have been a lot of kids from Louisiana that have played football at Ole Miss. A lot of kids from Mississippi have played football at LSU. So you got, you got a lot of that going on, too. Certainly not the height of Auburn, Alabama, or Michigan, Ohio State, or, you know, some other great rivalries across the country. But in its own way, as I've always said, LSU, the only major school without a true rivalry, 
uh, in, you know, in football for, for sure. Well, you know, what, what's happening, you go back in the history, in the 50s it was a great rivalry, in the 60s it was a great rivalry, but what happened with both programs is, is Ole Miss went one direction in the integration process, LSU went another, and so the Ole Miss program never, it just went down and down and down and down, and while it had some points where it had success, certainly LSU's had much more sustained, sustained success because back in the 50s, uh, certainly LSU Ole Miss was every bit the rival, it was certainly a better rival in the 50s than Alabama Auburn was, that's for darn sure. Uh, I think uh, if, you, if you look at the, the LSU Ole Miss rival, and this just takes us back to some, some big games uh, in the 70s, it looks like uh, David Woodley uh, under center there. Um, you know, those, those games, uh, you know, had a lot, it definitely is David Woodley. So, uh, you know, I think if you, look, uh, if you look at the history of the programs, Ole Miss certainly has not been able to take it to that next level and slip quite a bit where LSU is able to uh, be able to, to take the program and, and, and certainly got it to a completely different level in the, in the decade of the 2000s. But uh, really Ole Miss uh, in the 70s started to slip a little bit. Uh, and then uh, in the 80s, uh, it, then it really started to downfall in the 90s with the exception of the Eli era. And uh, again, a couple of good teams that uh, Houston had. They've, they've just been uh, near the bottom uh, of the SEC West uh, area. A New Orleans guy, quarterback there, John Forcade uh, mm -hmm. from Archbishop Shaw in New Orleans, and of course had a... And that's, as you said, a big part of a lot of, uh, a lot of Louisiana kids play and, uh, uh, you know, play at Ole Miss and a lot of Mississippi kids uh, at LSU. So th but, there's no question that... Uh, that was at one point for our younger audience. That was LSU's biggest rivalry. That was the biggest rivalry game. You know, even to some degree back in the old days, LSU Tulane had some rivalry when Tulane was a was a, a, a significant football program. That was a long time ago. But because of Ole Miss, because of Tulane, LSU, you're right, has lost that rivalry. Well, when we come back, we'll continue to talk about Ole Miss. We'll get some comments from Coach Les Miles. We will also get some comments from uh, Coach Houston Nutt and some players. And talk a little bit about that 09 uh, Ole Miss game, which uh, hasn't totally escaped the minds of the LSU coaching staff or of its fans. More Ole Miss when we return. Chris Landry, Tommy Kreis, and spread the roar. You're watching Tigers Roar on Pelican Sports TV, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, and New Orleans. <laughs> Miss Louisiana Team USA 2011. And I'm Paige Pennick, Miss Louisiana USA 2011. And, and you're, you're watching, watching Pelican, Pelican Sports TV. It's time to score double points. Papa's in the house. Get double points every day to earn free pizza fast with Papa Rewards at PapaJohns.com. The best way to kick off game day is with a better pizza, a Papa John's pizza. Plus, get a large works pizza or a Tuscan 6 cheese. Your choice, just $11 each. Get double points every day at PapaJohns.com. Better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John's. The official pizza sponsor of the NFL. Explore the charms of the North Shore and visit St. Tammany Parish. Whether you're looking for a cultural experience or an adventure, you'll find it here. Enjoy great attractions and fantastic dining in a relaxed and friendly atmosphere. Come visit us and discover the history and heritage that is Louisiana's North Shore. For more information, log on to louisiananorthshore.com slash bb. Hi, I'm attorney Kerry Bryson. My law firm focuses specifically on helping people try to solve their IRS tax problems. Lately, so many new out-of-state companies are popping up claiming that if you send them money, they can resolve your IRS problems. Well, what happens if they don't? Do you hire an attorney? Maybe you should start with a local attorney that's already handled hundreds of IRS cases right here in Louisiana. When you hire the Bryson Law Firm, you won't be speaking long distance or sending money to some out-of-town high-pressure salesman. You'll meet with us in person at our office right here in Baton Rouge. Your first visit is completely free and confidential and we'll tell you on the spot exactly how much it'll cost. So if you're hiring a company to resolve your IRS wage levies, bank levies, or tax liens, check their reputation first, then call me, Kerry Bryson, or go to brysonlawfirm.com. If you're a Louisiana resident and you have an IRS problem, hire a Louisiana attorney, Kerry Bryson. We 
continue with Tigers Roar, and again, Ole Miss is uh, having their issues. They will have a new head football coach next year. And a little later in the program, we'll talk about that coaching search and whether uh, also get Chris to update you on what's happening for you folks down in New Orleans tuned in uh, with the Tulane position. Of course, that is open as well. Here are some comments from Coach Les Miles, Coach Houston Nutt, and some players about Ole Miss's uh, scheme and game plan. Here now are those comments. Their uh, uh, leading rusher is uh, a gentleman named Jeff Scott, is uh, 529 yards. Brandon Bolden becoming more healthy uh, as we go. Uh, Randall Mackey, their quarterback, is a guy that we studied in high school and felt like that he had you know, a lot of ability. Coming out of high school, he didn't come straight to college, he had to go to a JUCO. So I think there he progressed as a better quarterback. And, you know, he did a great job staying with his dream. He's doing a great job leading the team, even though they have, they have a, a lot of victory, but he's making great plays for him. And I think he's going to come out with his best uh, performance here this Saturday. I think it's a big rivalry, you know, and uh, Ole Miss is going to bring a big challenge to us. And, you know, we just got to go out and uh, play with aggression and, and play fast and play determined to win. We recognize that uh, what we need to do is improve. What we need to do is play well on the road. And, uh, and play well against a very uh, inspired uh, Ole Miss team. Uh, we, we, uh, we talked about that uh, Sunday, and um, um, it's always been a very physical, tough game. Um, it's just uh, these guys are riding on a, an awful big high. They're, they're, they got good things going for them right now, and they know they're fighting for a national title. Uh, we're on the flip side of that, but uh, bottom line is, you know, we got an opportunity. We get an opportunity to play the best in the country, and our last home game for the seniors. We got a lot to play for, so uh, I'm expecting everybody to give everything they have. Well, I uh, again, I have always uh, enjoyed uh, the way he's prepared his teams. Uh, his, uh, you know, they've, they've always been extremely uh, competitive. Always come you know, games have, with his teams have come down to the wire, and uh, you know, I would I would expect that this team would be prepared in a like fashion. I think they're starting just a number of freshmen and sophomores at this time. And uh, I, I just, you know, in, in the future, all those guys will be a little bit more aged. And I, and I think that their teams will be uh, not only, you know, improved, but, uh, you know, the, the improvement with age certainly makes a difference. The thing about the game plan, one thing we have to teach our freshmen is just, uh, you know, you, you have to you have to really study the game plan. You know, you just, it's a lot different than just walking in when the lights come on and go play. And um, as talented as you are, you, you have to study the game and be consistent and, and do things the right way. We do want to point out on tonight's show, Wednesday night, that some of those comments by the players and in particular Coach Miles were made on Monday prior to the announcement of the suspension of Randall Mackey and Jeff Scott and Kovic uh, Neat. Uh, was that the other guy? Yeah, Kovic, Kovic Neat, Neat, correct. Uh, other guy. Corvick. Uh, Corvick, which, uh, which Mackey and Scott obviously were starters. So when Coach Miles made those comments, he was unaware that the suspension, suspensions would subsequently happen uh, later this week. So certainly not having those guys, as you mentioned, the uh, quarterback Cliff Stout's son will come in. They'll have to turn to somebody else to run the football. and. And when you're not a very good team and you remove two people and a backup that you were counting on to have contributions, especially the two starters, it, it handcuffs you even a little bit more. Well, and of course, Brandon Bolden is, uh, is going to play and certainly give them something in the running game. So they've got a capable back. Of course, he hurt his ankle. Uh, uh, in, uh, in the Brigham Young game, but uh, certainly he's a you know another local tie here. But Scotland Bill, that's right. going to give uh, give uh, you know give them something. They're going to have to find a way to run the football, take some pressure off of uh, Zach Stout, no question about it. Yeah, and so again they, they'll kick it off at six o'clock uh, up in Oxford, and uh, we will uh, have the WJBO Pelican Sports TV phones first post game show immediately following that game. You get a, a little look here. Obviously, LSU number one in uh, all polls. You can look at 10 and 0 overall, 6 and 0 in SEC. Defeated Western Kentucky 42 to 9 last week. Obviously, Ole Miss not rated 2 and 8 overall, 0 and 6 in the SEC. And I want to say, were they 0 and 8 in the SEC last year? Yeah, they they've lost uh, the 12 consecutive all right, SEC so, games. Okay, 12 consecutive SEC games. Louisiana Tech, the Bulldogs from up in Ruston, went into Oxford last week, and as you said, Chris, you know, 
clearly a 20-point victory that could have been worse. And, you know, with all due respect and credit to Louisiana Tech, who is bowl eligible this year and, you know, has had their share of good football teams and players up in Ruston, they're not supposed to go into Oxford and be able to win by 20. Well, no, certainly, again, it's, uh, it's, you can try to sugarcoat it and certainly what you try to focus in as a game like this is to focus on yourself and try to play through that game and try to challenge yourself. This is a, you're going to be a championship team. You got to show up and play every week. And uh, this, this Ole Miss will, will say Ole Miss on the helmets, and certainly uh, I expect them to give a really good effort and uh, maybe have some success early. But the reality is, having studied this Ole Miss team on tape, they've just not looked very good uh, at all at any point in time during the year. And quite frankly, it's got uh, it's got uh, worse and worse as the years gone by. And long. while I'm giving kudos to Louisiana Tech, didn't they go into Alabama and win a few years back? Uh, north, uh, northeast Louisiana did. Oh, northeast uh, Louisiana. Yeah, did. I thought okay. I think Tech yeah, also had a really big game against them. Almost beat them one night or something like that. So no disrespect to Louisiana Tech, and and you know if you're a Tech fan or you're from Louisiana, uh, it's good to see the Bulldogs go in there and get a victory against the Rebels. I, I'm sure that that's. I something. can tell you this. I saw Willie Rolfe block uh, John Copeland and Eric, and Eric Curry. That's what made uh, Willie Rolfe a first round pick in that game. That's what cemented it. I'm going back a little bit, but that great Alabama team, 1992, Willie Rolfe, Willie Rolfe played against that great defensive front. Um, long time, long pro time bowler game. for the Saints uh, as well. Now, Chris, let's go back to 2009, the last time the Tigers were in Oxford. Mm -hmm. Everybody's aware of it. The clock management was, was not done the way it was supposed to be done near the end of the game. LSU lost the football game, and, you know, the old spike the ball and the miscommunication and everything that happened. First, we're going to get some comments from Coach Miles and the players about that situation. Then we'll have Chris Landry elaborate on it. Here's Coach Miles and the players about the clock meltdown back in 09, LSU's last trip into Oxford to play Ole Miss. Of course, the game the following year here, uh, when it's uh, real tight, and I, I thought we were, you know, very, very physical and uh, played a good ball game there and. and Got all the way to the end and won a, won a close one. And I never forget so many letters and emails we got that, hey, you know, usually we don't win those games. We, we lose those games at the end. So that was a big, big memorable moment. I remember that there was a, a long pass that we completed um, and then sort of the, the time ran out uh, as the field goal team. Well, I, I don't remember exactly what was happening, but I remember the time ran out and we still could have got another playoff or something like that. That's what I remember. I remember us letting the game slip out of our hand. You know, we had it right there. You know, a lot of clock management kind of messed the things up for us, but it's something we learned from and uh, got better at, you know, throughout the rest of the season. Watching that. Uh, you know, I just remember a lot of the fans going crazy saying, you know, Coach Miles could have handled the game a little bit better and, uh, you know, we, we was definitely in position to win the game and, uh, you know, something backfired. So that's pretty much all I remember from the game. Not necessarily really in the back of my mind. Uh, you kind of just put that one aside. You know, you look back, you learn from it, and you just kind of throw it away after then and uh, move on. I think uh, it shouldn't have been that close, you know. But I, I don't think it's going to be that close this year. You know, we just, we can't, we can't put ourselves in that type of situation to where the clock's running out and you got to get the field goal team on the field. You know, we got we to play smart. And, you know, we got to go in there and not put ourselves in that type of position. We, we did a, a couple of things immediately thereafter differently. And, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, again, I think there are those things that you learn from. Certainly we learned from that one. Ever since then and, you know, uh, the Tennessee game, we've been practicing on clock management, you know, to the full extent. You know, we don't want that to happen ever, ever again. And I feel like we, we learned our lesson from those times. and. Uh, we're coming out, you know, spiking the ball and doing what we have to do to get in the end zone this time. We practice that every every week um, ever since that. Well, obviously, I wasn't here after that happened, but ever since I've been here, we practice all the time um, a quick situation, run on the field, and get the snap down, and kick a field goal. So if that if that situation does come up, we'll be ready for it. There was also some a lot of emails that said that I was going to be here as long as Johnny Ball during that time. I, that comes to my mind. So uh, those things, uh, it's amazing, you know. I had to throw that out because that's, it popped in my mind, but that's the, that just shows you how quickly, you know, our, our game is that, you know, those, those games are in the rearview mirror. All right, Chris 
Coach Landry, it's time for you to elaborate. You, you, you've been there, done that. When a coaching staff, like after the Ole Miss situation in 09, when that staff gets together the next morning and everybody's had a chance to sleep on it a little bit, you know, let, let's, let's, you know, call a spade a spade. They know that what happened wasn't supposed to have transpired the way it did. What does that coaching staff do, led by the head coach Les Miles? And I know the coaching staff is not identical today as it was that Sunday morning. But how does a staff as a whole, led by their leader, in this case Les Miles, address that situation? Well, first of all, I don't know how much sleep they got that night before, um, uh, the, you know, the night of the game. Listen, I think the first thing you have to do as a staff, you have to go, and, and that was a byproduct of, of trying to do too much at a time where you don't have time to do it. You can't be shifting personnel, and you have to have a plan for that situation, and everybody knows who's in there. You can't be trying to get the best matchup at that time. You've got to go and have your best thing set for that particular moment. What you have to do first of all, I think, is you gotta own up to it. You gotta you gotta to your players you gotta apologize to them because that loss was strictly on the coaching staff. And then because I think I think that's the only way you maintain respect on your in your on your, on your with your team. You've got to go through situation by situation how how it went awry. Uh, you 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 don't want it to be because there there's certainly a major flaw there and a major person that was responsible for that. You don't want to point fingers. You want to take that blame as a staff and how to correct it. And this is how we're going to go about fixing this from here on out. And uh, it's something that, quite frankly, you, you need to have done prior to that. But obviously, this made it uh, all the more important to basically sit down in this situation. Here's what we need to do in two minutes. Here's how we're going to design it. Here's how we're going to teach it, and here's how we're going to practice it, and you have to go out and do it so that it doesn't happen again. Yeah, now, let me ask you this question. Even in today's technological world, is it, it's, I'm going to say, I'm going to rephrase that, it's probably impossible to prepare for everything in a football game that could happen, or is it possible to prepare well, for it all? Or, you know, as Bear Bryant said, expect the unexpected. Yeah, so do you have to have a plan in case... <clears throat> You, the last thing on earth you thought was going to happen happens at the end of the half or the end of the game or the start of the third quarter. You know, you, I mean, what do you got to do there? Here's the thing. You've got to prepare for any number of situations, and you spend a whole, a whole large part, part of your final day on two minutes, just two minutes. So you practice just that. Now, a lot of things of what you do encompasses anything that could happen in the two minutes. This is how we're going to do and. Here's the bottom line is you can be prepared, and under the pressure of the moment, the speed of the moment, your players might not be able to execute. They, they might not. You just have to get them prepared. In this case, they weren't prepared. I mean, they, they were not prepared. They were trying to get players in and out. Coaches on the sideline were not prepared. It, you know, so that was all on the coaching staff. All you can do is prepare your team, just like any play, any situation, to be prepared for it doesn't mean that it's going to work or they're going to execute it. doesn't mean they're not going to forget it, you know, uh, because they can. I mean, it's just like anything else. But you, what you do is universally you prepare in that situation. You always got to be aware of the down and distance, you know, kill the clock, your timeout situations. You've got to be able to communicate that because that's going to always take you to what you want to do in that situation. And you have to have your couple of basics, what you're going to do, because you don't have time to, call, to signal it in. The player already knows. He's got the play in that situation. This is what we're going to do. And here's the options off of it. And you've got to know the down and distance. You obviously can't spike it on fourth down. you obviously got to know. I mean, you can't, uh, r for example, you, you have no timeouts. You've got a little longer part of the field. You can't, <laughs> you, you can't, uh, you, or you can't run the time out. You don't have enough time to get there. And you got to be prepared for that. You got to be prepared in a situation where you're going to spike it, or are you in a situation with more time? Do you have your your field goal team ready to run on the field and kick the field goal? Uh, it's always better if you can, and you have the time and you have the downs to spike it, regroup, and then set things up correctly. But you have to be prepared for both, and so everything else kind of falls under that umbrella. But it doesn't necessarily mean it always works out. But in this case, this was just a case of, 
you know, the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. It's kind of like the analogy we've used on radio more than once. I can go to the Caddyshack driving range and I can hit my seven iron 160 yards and land it in a 55 gallon drum, you know, five out of 10 times. I can get, get that thing going, but can I transfer that to the golf course when I'm in the fairway and they got a, Under green, pressure. They got a green that's the size of 155 gallon uh, drums and I can't hit the green with the seven iron when on the driving range or the practice range, you, you know, it's got to, you got to transfer it. Well, as you said, you have to be prepared for it all, but there's no guarantee that when the clock's ticking and you're in Oxford and the place is going nuts that you're going to be able to execute. Well, yeah, and, you know, listen, I think we sort of heard some of it, even it, it, this far removed from it. You heard them say, Les Miles say, we started, we, get, we began to work on some things right after that, which is, again, having talked to some of the staff members at that time and asked them what happened. We weren't prepared for it, and and that's that that's a flaw that you can't ever have as a coach. You you have to be prepared for that situation. Uh, that was that was not a weird. I mean, it was weird how it played out. But that's something you practice every week. Two minute situations. How are you going to handle that? They just didn't prepare for it well enough, and the byproduct was uh, they were not uh, they were not prepared on the football field because they weren't prepared off the field for it. We've got a whole other hour for you of. Tigers Roar TV still to come in the next hour. We'll have the uh, LSU breakdown offense. We'll talk some quarterbacks, running backs. We'll talk LSU defense. We'll uh, take our weekly run through the LSU athletic department. We're going to talk some BCS, some Harris Poll, some Heisman Trophy. we got a bunch of things for you. We'll also, a little bit later in the second hour, hear from Ronnie Rance of Sports Shorts TV and Sports Shorts Radio with some LSU baseball things you're going to want to hear. I'll give you a hint. It involves football players. With Chris Landry, I'm Tommy Christ, and a whole other hour here on a Wednesday. If you're catching us Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, you got a rebroadcast going. Stay with us. Spread the roar. We're online at PelicanSportsTV.com. And, of course, Pelican Sports TV, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, and New Orleans. We'll be right back.